Hello, everyone. How are you doing out there in eclipse land? This 2024 eclipse season is crazy. Oh my goodness. So many emotions flowing, so much energy going on, and so many things happening in the cosmos all at once. It's almost exhausting and overwhelming in so many ways. So today, we're going to look at the astrological language, the full chart, and I really want to focus on the context of this solar eclipse chart because it's not just about the sun being in Aries and the north node being in Aries. Those are a huge part of the story. But if you don't look at the entire chart in context, you're going to miss out on many of the key pieces that are really influencing the energy. As I've talked about in other videos, which I'll link below, this Aries season in 2024 is not like a typical Aries season. Not at all. There's a really different energy going on. And if we leave that out of the solar eclipse conversation, we're going to be, in a sense, more disillusioned than we need to be and not be able to really tap into this energy in a way that fully helps us enlighten, move forward, and get the energetic invitations of what the eclipse could potentially promise in your life. So let's begin. All right. So as we go through this, I'm going to talk about the major planetary players and kind of break down some of this other energy because I know a lot of you out there are new or learning or have been into astrology for a while but haven't quite made full connections. So I want to help empower you to be able to use astrology in a more constructive and again, practical way so you can apply it for your own life. So just very briefly, those of you who are new, if you've been listening to my videos for a while, then you know that often I start my videos with some basics so that we can all be on the same page. And when we're talking about astrology, the planet is the most important part of the astrological conversation. It's not the science. Okay, sun sign astrology has kind of given us the perception that the signs are the most important, but it's actually the planet. So the planet's the action. That's what is happening. The sign is how that action is happening, how it's being perceived. The house on your chart is the slice where the action is taking place. And the aspects are the conversation between the planets. How are the planets talking to each other? What kind of energy do they have together? Okay. And I'll say it a million times, I'm sure, but astrology is super complex. There are so many layers to what's happening at any given time that it's important to include as many of these layers as you can. And as you get more astrologically savvy, kind of keep in the back of your mind what else is going on. Because sometimes myself or other astrologers, we don't have time to go through every single thing that's happening all the time. But if you can reference back, oh yeah, we're in this cycle. Oh yeah, we're in this time period. It'll help you already make even deeper connections as you go forward in your astrological journey. And the other thing here that I think is so, so, so important is astrology describes potential. It doesn't guarantee an outcome. There has been, you know, a long period of time and it's come back around to be very trendy to engage with pop astrology and fatalistic astrology. And there's not that there's anything wrong with those types of astrologies by any stretch of the means. I'm not trying to say one is better than the other, but just keep in mind that you know, we also have free will. So what we are doing also affects outcomes, what we choose to do, what we choose not to do, um, our own relationship to planetary energies and other people. And there's many, many factors that come in that can, you know, alter the timeline that we're on, so to speak. So anytime you're looking at astrology, we're talking about an energetic potential, not necessarily a hard and fast guaranteed outcome. So kind of building on that, my astrological perspective is just the way that I look at astrology is through the lens of evolutionary and humanistic astrology. So there's many, many different types of astrology. There's traditional, there's shamanic, there's um, psychological, there's um, medical, there's orary. We can go on and on and on. There's many, many, many different ways in which we can use the astrological language like language itself, right? There's many different languages and many different dialects also within specific languages and so on. So kind of keep that in mind as we're going through that my perspective here is to help you make connections to your soul's evolution and your self-determination in this lifetime. 
All right, getting to the eclipses. So eclipses, they're portals of change and leaps forward potentially. And we'll talk about a little bit more what that means, because this may not personally impact you in a big way. Okay, this may be something that you see more out in the collective rather than something that affects you personally. So we'll talk about that when we get down to the houses and some different um, things that you can look at. So the lunar eclipse that just happened on March 25th, okay, 2024, at five degrees Libra. Now, this eclipse was part of a different moon family, meaning its roots traced back to September 25th, 2022. That was the new moon at this degree in Libra. Okay. When we had the eclipse last week on the 25th, the 24th, for some of you, that was the full moon point. So this is when we were seeing in fullness what's been happening. And this eclipse family, this Libra cycle, because remember we're talking about bigger cycles, will continue all the way through the end of this year, 2024. So there'll be some other things wrapping up here. When we're talking about moon cycles, we're talking about a two and a quarter year period of time for the fullness to go through. So yes, it happens in smaller increments of that month, right? The month the cycle of the moon going all the way around the zodiac. Yes, that is important, but you also have to look at it in the bigger picture as well. So why I bring this up, the total eclipse, the total solar eclipse, it's happening on April the 8th. That's a new moon energy. And this new moon happens to start off its own moon cycle. So this is the beginning. When we're talking about new moons, we're talking about planting seeds. We're talking about setting intentions or visualizations. We're not necessarily talking about the action yet. We need more things to be revealed. At the new moon, and this is doubly true for an eclipse, we're talking about, in a sense, being in the dark, right? And when the eclipse happens, it eclipses the sun, right? The light of the sun during the day disappears for a period of time. It, it's blocked out. So we're really, in a sense, in the dark about what exactly this eclipse is going to bring up for us. So keep that in mind with all this Aries energy, because Aries likes to sometimes be hasty, right? A lot of us are feeling this impatience to want to be there already. And that has to do with Pluto and Aquarius as well, but that's a separate conversation. So when we're looking at this eclipse, we're talking about the time period between April the 8th, 2024, wrapping up this story, whatever we begin, whatever seeds we plant here, all the way to July 7th, 20, or excuse me, no, that's not right. Ooh. Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, July 7th, 2026. So that will be kind of the end of that energy. That'll be the payoff that we see at that point. So <clears throat> looking at all this, keeping this in mind. Okay, so I'm going to bring up this eclipse chart briefly, just so that you can start to see if you haven't seen the eclipse chart already, what kind of energy we're talking about. And again, the context of the whole chart matters. One of the biggest things that we can see here is the predominant energy is conjunction. And just for those of you who are new, conjunction means side by side. Okay, joined together like peanut butter and jelly. So conjunctions amplify energy. They take both energies and pump it up. And the other thing that's significant here when we look at this is all of the planets are between the last two signs, which are Aquarius and Pisces, and the first two signs of the zodiac, Aries and Taurus. Because remember, the south node is not a planet. Okay, it's a point. And this over here, this AS, this is the ascendant. You can um, ignore that depending on where you live in the sky that or in the world that may or may not pertain to you. So you can ignore that. But when we look at this, there's so much energy pushed together in one area that we're talking about the last two signs, right? That's ending energy. That's transpersonal energy, meaning beyond just the self. But we're also talking about the first two signs, which are beginnings and personal energy. So we have this interesting juxtaposition that's been going on and it'll continue to go on for a while of cycles ending and cycles opening in a very, very visceral way. Of course, this is always happening to some degree, but right now it's loud, it's in our face, it's hard to ignore, right? This is very, very much where we're at 
ending, dissolving away Pisces, so many structures, Saturn, things that have been going on in our belief systems, um, ways we've been, ways we've done life, ways we've thought about ourselves and our place in the cosmos. All of those kinds of things are changing dramatically and rapidly. Also, thanks to our friend Pluto, who's an Aquarius, and Aquarius likes to move fast, right? It goes beyond, it goes out, it goes further, it brings things to an apex with the help of our friend Uranus and Saturn as well. So I've done other videos where I've talked about this specifically. If you want to look there in my playlist around uh, the Pluto in Aquarius list. So we have all that going on, but we also have this Aries stellium. So if you're not familiar with the term stellium, what it means is a grouping of energy. So when we talk about conjunction, they're planets next to each other. A stellium is many planets, at least three um, or more planets in the same sign right next to one another. And so if we look at this chart, we've got Venus, right? We have the North Node, the Moon, the Sun, Chiron and Mercury in retrograde, all in Aries. That is a ton of Aries energy. Even if we took out uh, the North Node and Chiron, that would still be Venus, Moon, Sun, and Mercury. Okay, so that's a lot of Aries energy. When we look at all of this energy, when we look at the hierarchy of planets, okay, who's in charge? This is like when you go to work for a company, okay? Who's in charge of the company? Now, there may be someone who's like, sorry to bring up any corporate things for those of you that have like corporate trauma. I'm so sorry. But um, in a sense, it's like, well, who who do you answer to if, you know, you're you're a new employee? Oh, okay, you have, you know, a supervisor or a boss or a manager or something. Well, who do they answer to? Well, who do they answer to? And so on and so on until you get to the top of the chain, in essence, kind of the owner of the company. And whoever that is, whatever planet that is at the top, that energy trickles down, right? It trickles down through that company energy, through what they do, through their mission statement, right? Through the ways that they do their work and the way that maybe you're expected to do the work. So you can think of planets like that as well. When we're talking about Aries. We're talking about Mars. Mars is the planet that's associated with Aries. It's the planet in charge of Aries, what we call the ruler of Aries. So we have to look at on the chart where Mars is. And Mars happens to be right now in Pisces next to our friend Saturn. So when we look at Mars and Pisces, it has its own energy. But who rules Pisces? Who's associated with Pisces? Right? Well, that happens to be Jupiter and Neptune. Now, I use the modern rulerships, so I do include Neptune. Some astrologers don't, and that's completely fine. In my opinion, we have to look at both planets to get the, the fullest picture. But if we look at Jupiter, Jupiter is sitting in Taurus. Well, who's in charge of Taurus? All right, it's Venus. Where's Venus? Well, she's in Aries. Who's in charge of Aries? Mars, which goes back to, again, Jupiter and Neptune. Same thing with the south node. The south node is in Libra. Who's in charge of Libra? It's Venus, right? So we would repeat that pattern. And Jupiter and Venus are interesting because they're two of everyone's favorite planets, right? It's like, oh, Venus, yay, she's a benefic. Oh, Jupiter, yay, he's a benefic. And that's true. But they also have their challenging sides as well. You know, Venus has a lot to do with envy and jealousy and uh, vanity and laziness and manipulation, things like that. We don't tend to associate Venus with those things. But she has that, that side to her, that unskilled side to her. And same with Jupiter. You know, Jupiter can exaggerate. Jupiter can be, in a sense, like a con artist, just like Neptune. So we have this interesting energy here where Jupiter, right, Venus, are going back and forth, and they could be in their positive senses as well. Like, do you feel more connected to your own value, right? Venus and Aries and that Jupiter and Taurus, what are your beliefs about value and worth? Taurus is always asking the question, what's worth it? And that's a great question to ask, right? Where do we want to put our inborn talents and resources, this is a good question, especially coming up in the creation of the new paradigm and the new world that we're going through. So we have all of that going on, but we also look at, if we look at our friend Neptune, Neptune is the natural ruler of Pisces. So because Neptune is in its home sign, 
there's nowhere else to go, right? In essence, Neptune is the final boss on this chart. It was on the lunar eclipse chart as well. It was on the equinox chart. We have this tremendous Neptune energy that we can't ignore, okay? Neptune in the final degrees. The final degrees of a sign amplify the sign's energy as well. It makes it louder. It makes it feel more critical because it's wrapping up its story. And when it's an outer planet like Neptune that takes a long time to move, we feel that all the more intensely. Something like the moon we're not going to really feel because the moon only spends about two to two and a half days per sign. We don't feel that as much as a sign like Neptune that takes about 14 years to move. Okay, so the slower the planet moves, the more we feel the effects as it's closing or beginning its energy. So Neptune, what do we know about Neptune? Neptune is a beautiful planet. When we invite Neptune in in a constructive way, Neptune connects us to that which is bigger than ourself, right? Connects us to God, to spirit, to the field, okay? Whatever that is for you. Connects us out to real agape love, to compassion, to this boundaryless oneness. Neptune and Pisces share that in common that they return to the one, right? The end of the zodiac before we begin again in Aries, the return home to God, spirit, source, okay? So all that is happening. And Neptune can also bring us in what sometimes we refer to as the muse, right? We find Neptune in charts of people who are highly artistic in some way or musical or in theater or photography or filmmaking, something of that sort. Neptune can be beautiful here, so Neptune, how do we use Neptune in a positive way right now? We need to bring that in. So think about the positive sides of Neptune and how you can engage with Neptune over these next few months while Neptune is in charge of these charts, is in charge of a lot of the transits that are going on in the sky right now. How can you bring a positive expression? Because if you don't, we bring the so-called negative, the unskilled expressions in. Not to say that these are bad. So having these unskilled expressions is also important because they teach us a lot as well. One of the big challenges with Neptune has to do with deception, with disillusionment, right? Or illusion really is, is, is more the problem than disillusionment often. With addiction, with escapism, with in essence, this like bottomless pit of yearning that we don't know how to fill. And so we fill it with mind altering substances, with uh, joining perhaps a religious or spiritual, you know, organization that takes over our lives, or we engage in things like gambling or um, anything, again, that takes us out of ourself. And it doesn't have to be a bad thing, but it can be because we can get lost right? We can get too far out there, especially people who are talking right now about, you know, ascending and things like that, but don't understand how grounded you have to be when you are going through ascension, when you are contacting higher realms. If you have no grounding, you have no way back home to yourself. You don't know what you're meeting out there and you don't know how to get back, right? We can see this out in the world right now. This is a big thing that's going on. It also has a lot to do with not being able to discern what's real. And this can be a positive thing, right? Um, it's the things that can't be proven, which again, you know, let's say, let's take the the big one. Let's take, let's take God, for example. Do we have a tangible expression of God? Well, yes, of course, we can see it in everything. But at the same time, it's intangible, right? It's both at the same time. So things that are intangible, right, are dream states. They're not really tangible in a sense where, you know, I you can touch it, right? It may feel like it, but it's not. And this goes, of course, off into the weeds and we can really go down, um, you know, the whole thing about what is real and empty space and how everything we think is solid is is only empty space. And of course, all those kinds of things. But then we can also go too far, right, and lose our mind, which 
happens with Neptune, with Pisces, with those final degrees, and also with Jupiter as well. Jupiter is the uh, traditional ruler of Pisces. We can lose ourself, right? We can lose touch with reality. We can lose touch with morality as well. So be aware of that, right? Be aware of questioning what you see. I know with AI, right? We're all kind of talking about that, like what's real, what's not real. Um, what you hear, what people are saying, the social medias, um, the virtual realities, all of these kinds of things, they're amazing. They're amazing. But they're also potentially, you know, pulling us into down to the depths of the bottom of the ocean where we are not necessarily equipped to survive. So just keep that in mind. So why am I bringing all this kinds of stuff up? Well, it has to do with the chart. It's affecting all of this Aries energy. So Aries, normally when we talk about Aries, we're talking about energy that's, you know, it's the warrior energy. It's the I am energy. It takes up space and it's bold and courageous. It acts first and thinks later and all of those kinds of of things. That's some of the positive expressions of Aries. But a lot of that is being thwarted right now. And much of it has to do with Mars being in Pisces, Neptune being in charge of all the planets right now and dissolving away some of the energy, Pisces diffusing away the energy of Mars, but also with Chiron here. And we'll talk more about that as we go through. But Chiron sitting in Aries, Chiron has to do with where we feel outside or rejected or wounded in some way, but it also has to do with great teachings, great compassion, great mentorship, and great healing. So that's also going on in Aries, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a bit. So when we look at this, again, you see me underline things and, and highlight them, right? This is not typical in Mars energy. If you've noticed, you don't really feel that same kind of get up and go, right? It's Mars is a little bit, um, Aries is a little bit almost like cranky right now. Have you noticed that <laughs> out in the world? Maybe it's, maybe it's you, maybe it's other people, maybe it's both. But there's something in here that feels like our drive isn't quite where it should be. And we'll talk about that more as well. So another piece here, when we're talking about this eclipse, let me clear out these drawings. So I know that's, that's a lot of of stuff on there. So we're talking about the eclipse. We're talking about the nodes, okay? The sun and the moon. Okay, that's what makes an eclipse is when they're close to one another. And we're also talking about the degree they're at. So the sun moon are at 19 degrees. So that means that this is happening at 19 degrees. And if you notice, our friend Chiron is also at 19 degrees. It's right on the money. I mean, 24 minutes, 24 minutes, right? 23 minutes. It's almost as exact as, as you can be in a meaningful way. So Chiron is super impacting this chart. Okay. And when we look at this 19 degree moment, we also have to look at what's behind this lunation. So I've talked about this in other videos, but when you look at this, you can't just look at this. Okay, are you, are you catching on to why you can't just say, oh, it's it's a new moon in Aries and so it's new and grab your swords and wow, let's go be warriors, yay! Like that's, yes, but not really what's happening, right? That's reductive and, and I won't go further on that. That's reductive, okay? It's not the whole picture, right? Where's Mars? Well, Mars is behind the lunation. Mars hasn't even caught up yet, right? As the ruling planet, Saturn hasn't caught up, Neptune, um, Pluto, they haven't caught up. They're all behind. These big, slow, heavy hitting planets are all behind lunation and of even more significance, the ruler of Aries, the planet that's in charge of Aries is behind the lunation. So Mars will not catch up to this degree. It won't pass over this degree until May the 25th, 2024. Okay. At that point, Jupiter one of the ruling planets of Pisces will be just on the precipice. It'll be at 29 degrees of Taurus, which is also significant, but it'll be just about to move into Gemini. Okay, so that's where we're really going to start to see some more of what the heck this total eclipse means. When Mars comes in and activates it, Mars is an action-oriented planet, we're going to see that. When Jupiter moves into a new sign and moves away from 
this Uranus, which has really been shaken up that Jupiter energy, we're going to get more clarity. Okay. So that's something to keep in mind. That's a big thing to keep in mind as we go forward. <clears throat> So just quickly, because I've talked a lot already, but just quickly, the Aries Libra axis, what are we talking about here? Because when we're talking about the eclipses, right, we have the sun, the moon, and the nodes sitting in Aries and or Libra, okay, depending on which one of the eclipses we are talking about. Right now, we have the sun, moon, and north node moving into Aries for that, that total solar eclipse, and we have the south node in Libra. So we're talking about the skillful expressions of Aries. Again, we're talking about I am energy. It's enthusiastic. It's courageous. It's instinctive. It's a pace setter, right? Aries likes to be first. So wherever you have Aries on your chart, that's probably where you like to be first or do new things or are exploring or, or maybe more straightforward, less complicated, right? Aries is about our will and our motivation, our independence, our beginnings, right? Aries deals with conflict, right? The rams, they butt heads, literally, to work things out. We're talking about competition as well. Libra, we're talking about the opposite side here, right? Because when we're talking about the signs, we're really talking about polarities. We're talking about the same subjects, but from different ends of that subject. One is more personal, one is a little bit more subjective. When we're talking about Libra, it's more um, of the excuse me, not subjective, we're talking about objective. Libra is more objective. So Libra is a little bit more that you are energy. It's the awareness of others. It's charming, right? It's negotiating, it's social skills, it's civil, okay? It knows the art of persuasion and the art of negotiation because Libra is looking for peace, right? If Aries is to use this term, you know, more of that warrior energy, that fighting energy, Aries is supposed to be more of that dipl the diplomacy, war and peace, right? So Libra is also a little bit more aloof. It's an air sign. It's very rational, right? It's more into ideas. It's less messy, right? Our friend Scorpio, that's the messy relationship sign. And Scorpio will get down to um, the crumbs at the bottom of the toaster. As the comedian Chris Rock had this great bit about relationships and how you can't just like the what, you know, the fluffy center of the bread, right? Hello, Libra. You gotta like the burnt stuff, the bits at the bottom of the toaster too. Otherwise, you're not really engaging fully in your relationship, which I always find funny when we're thinking about this. But when we're looking at Aries and Libra, when they're working together, right? Independence and codependence, right? I need myself, I need others. When they're in balance, we're talking about coherence and interdependence. I am a me, you are a you, together or are we, and that's how we move forward. It's not just shifting to exclusively one side or the other. And we're talking about the shadow sides, the negative or unskillful expressions of Aries and Libra. In a sense, what we're doing is flipping the switch, right? We're kind of putting the, the Libra qualities into Aries, and it kind of messes up Aries and vice versa. Right? They kind of become this inverse um, sense of themselves. So Aries can be immature, can be very dependent, right? self-neglecting, um, afraid, passive, timid, overly modest, overly agreeable. Libra, on the other hand, can create conflict. Right, So they have something to balance. They have something to negotiate. They can be unjust. They can be insecure and irrational and intolerant, it can be lazy, vain, wishy-washy, right? Libra is the sign of politicians. Think about how many politicians are wishy-washy, right? They say the thing in a charming way just to get elected. And then once they're in the gates, they don't do a darn thing they said they were going to do, right? Um, a negative expression of Libra can be imbalanced or needy or manipulative. Again, we tend to think of this as just Scorpio's territory, but Libra can be highly manipulative because they understand people, because they're trying to negotiate a deal, right? When you use that skill, that power, in essence, for good, the good of all, right, it's a great thing. But when you're using it for not those purposes, it turns into something quite ugly. 
So again, we want that balance between Aries and Libra. The nodes, when we're talking about the North Node, we're talking about pulling in, energizing, looking at wherever that North Node is, that sign's energy. We're being invited right now into Aries themes. Okay, we're in essence writing a new chapter in our Aries house with our Aries planets. Okay, it's an invitation to look at and to embrace the Aries qualities that we may be lacking. There's a lot of talk with North Node, South Node about do the North Node and get rid of the South Node. And I would argue that that's um, not a smart thing to do, right? Case in point, if we look at Aries and Libra, do you really want to completely get rid of relating, being civilized, having harmony and balance? Do you really want to get rid of those things? No. What you want to move away from are the more unsavory, right? The unskilled things from Libra. That's what we're trying to move away from. With the North Node and Aries, we're trying to embrace these more positive and skillful qualities. So make sure you're keeping that in mind because that's what we're looking at um, as these nodes are transiting, not just this eclipse, but the Aries and Libra parts of our charts up until January of 2025. And again, we talked about the South node a little bit. So hopefully you've gotten a better idea around what this actually means in your own chart. All right, we got to talk about Chiron and Aries. This is a big deal. Why is it a big deal? Because it is sitting exactly on, get my pen here, 19 degrees Aries, right? 24 minutes with the sun, with that moon and next to the North Node. So Chiron and Aries. It's been in Aries since April of 2018, and it will stay in Aries until June of 2026. So we're getting towards the end, but we're not quite there yet. We've got a couple more years of Chiron being in Aries before he moves on into Taurus. When we're talking about transiting Chiron, okay, so when a planet is transiting, or in this case, an asteroid is transiting, it's energizing and it's activating wherever it is. That could be just your house. If you don't have any planets, your natal chart, it might be um, planets as well. But when it's transiting and it's sitting next to things in the sky, it's talking to those planets as well. So right now it's talking to the sun, the moon, the north node, and Mercury. Okay. It's close enough to Mercury that I would count it. So Chiron, again, Chiron's theme around being the wounded healer, I think is great. But again, I think it's a little reductive because Chiron wasn't just the centaur that was suffering. His story is much deeper than that. The mythology around that is much deeper. Chiron um, was abandoned as a child. His parent story differs um, depending on, on what mythology you read. But um, his dad was a titan, one of the gods, um chronos which we there's some debate on whether or not that's saturn and his mom was a nymph so there was some immortality there and chiron was abandoned at birth apollo found chiron and brought chiron up in some depictions chiron has just the back end of a horse and the front of a human Later Roman depictions gave him the full body of a horse and just the top like a centaur. So I find that interesting. Um, but either way, he didn't fit in. Right? He wasn't fully human. He wasn't fully centaur. He wasn't mortal. He was more immortal. But he didn't really fit in the realm of the gods either. And why is this significant? Well, Chiron can represent for us where we feel rejected where we feel like we're an outsider, where we feel like we'll never fit, okay? But him being adopted by Apollo, being brought up by Apollo, Apollo was the sun god at one point, and Apollo taught him the arts and alchemy and astrology and astronomy and healing and, you know, all philosophies and all these kinds of things. Chiron later became a teacher and a mentor to others and imbued these qualities to other. A 
Apollo's sister, Athena. Was it Athena? Oh my goodness. No, Artemis. Excuse me. She taught Chiron also about compassion and about love and hunting and all these different things. So Chiron had this really difficult beginning, but got a lot of amazing things growing up, which he shared with other people. So when we're talking about Chiron, we're talking about where we can also teach, where we can also mentor, where we can bring in compassion, okay, where we are sensitive, not just where we're suffering, not just where the, the end story of Chiron is he gets shot by a poison arrow and the irony that he can't heal himself, even though he's the greatest healer that ever was. And he ends up trading his immortality um, to, to ultimately die and then become a constellation in the sky. It's not just that beginning and ending suffering for him, which he did suffer. All those Greek stories are so full of tragedy and suffering. It's it's a bit grotesque for me <laughs> a lot of the time. But anyhow, um, it's not just that. It's also where we can be humble. Again, where we can share with others. What gifts have we learned? Have we been taught? that we can teach to the next generation or to someone else to help them towards their greatness. It's a really important piece with Chiron. So when we're talking about Chiron and Aries, we're talking about new cycles. Aries always begins new cycles. We're talking about sensitivity to Aries themes, right? Personal will, drive, courage, um, instinct, independence, but even things as difficult as just existing right? Being alive, the pain of being alive. A lot of us have felt that over the past years, right? Since 2018, some days it's just the pain of being a human on the earth right now is a big challenge that we're all dealing with in some way. So it's an invitation for us to reorient our beliefs around our own rejection, our own suffering, right? Our own abandonment issues by seeing it reflected in others or potentially once we can, you know, see it in this way, realize that we may be projecting it onto others as well. This is an, this eclipse is an amazing opportunity to heal projection, Okay, what we are unwilling to look at in ourselves because maybe we feel ashamed of it, right? So we reflect it out there, right? Libra, it's not me, it's you, okay? You're the problem. It's you who's causing my pain and suffering. You're the one holding me back. There's something here that a lot of us need to take a look at, okay? So there's a deep, deep, deep with this eclipse opportunity to gain compassion. Right? Chiron was very compassionate. Um, compassionate integration for ourselves, right? Invite the parts of ourselves back in so that we can ultimately transcend and transform those shame stories, right? Those blame stories, the projection, the disintegration, the fragmentation, right? That we all have, to more or less degree, to bring that back together towards wholeness. That is one of the gifts that's coming up, although it's a difficult one to deal with. So, so some of the questions to ask yourself with Chiron and Aries, right? Are you willing to engage with curiosity and humility around any sensitization, right, that you may have in the Aries part of your chart? Okay. If it's Aries in your 10th house, for example, is there something that's been going on around your career or your public identity that has been wounded or rejected or didn't go the way you thought it should? Can you get curious about what that might mean and why it feels the way it does for you? Can you um, work with this kind of energy? Are you willing to do that? In another way, it might be there's some gift or expertise that you have or would like to develop, right, that you can share with other people. Okay, this is a big story right now. And then again, what parts of yourself feel rejected or outside the norm that you want to bring back in, right? Once we bring things we're ashamed of back in, they don't hold the power over us anymore to create pain and suffering in a way that impedes us from becoming who we are born to be right? That's a possibility with this eclipse that I find particularly beautiful. Mercury. Mercury is going to be retrograde 
while this eclipse is happening. So Mercury will be in retrograde from April the 1st to the 25th. Now, as one of the personal planets, Mercury has more of like a day-to-day -day relationship with us. We deal a lot with Mercury. We communicate with our own natal Mercury. That's our style. That's how we learn. That's how we like to talk and speak and make connections. Okay. So that's an important part of our natal chart. And it's also something important to keep in mind with other people. What's their style, right? Because this eclipse also has to do with how we relate ourselves and other people. So when we're talking about Mercury in Aries, right? Mercury thinks fast. It's intuitive. It's, it's a sharp wit at this point, right? It can be loud and bold and assertive or even aggressive. Right? because we're talking about Aries the ram, right? It can butt heads. We can be butting up with others with our words right now. Um, one of the challenges here with Mercury is being impatient, right? Speaking with impatience, getting impatient with ourselves, impatient, like, come on, come on, come on, right? Mental process. Um, we're using our words to fight. I have noticed that out in the world right now that people have been um, in an unconscious way, right? Verbally aggressive, so just being aware of that. Now, when we're talking about retrograde, we're talking about the opportunity to go back, okay, because the planet looks like it's going backward from our perspective on Earth. It's not really, but it looks like it from our view. So we can go back, we can review, right? We can redo, we can rewrite, reorient all those RE words, re, right? We get a do over. Okay, and this is really, really important, right? We are being offered second chances to go back and look at something in the Aries part of our chart to make more connections, okay? Or to go back and maybe we need to apologize or maybe we receive an apology for something that came up, right? Remember, Aries, uh, Mercury has a bit of a verbal punch to it, right? So maybe that comes up. When we're talking about Mercury being next to Chiron and the sun and the moon, there could be opportunities for connections and realizations about possible stories around our self-identity, around our emotions, right? Around our past, which is the moon, right? And our future, which is the sun, what we're moving towards, okay? We may have the ability to examine and let go of disappointments, okay? That's one of the hard things with Aries is when it gets disappointed, all the fire signs, right, are subject to disappointment. So there's a possibility here to look at that, look at disappointment or rejection or loss of will. Maybe we can see something useful now. Maybe something will be shown to us through that eclipse that helps us move forward and get back on track. We also, in my opinion, have the opportunity to learn more around healing patterns of self-sabotage, Right? Limiting stories, um, loss of passion, loss of purpose, loss of desire, right? Or even just feeling that pain of, of existing. That pain in Aries is a masculine, a yang energy, right? That that part of ourselves, or maybe it's out in the world, you know, there's been a lot of pain projected at men right now not saying it's not deserved in in certain circumstances but in general there's a lot of that going on in the world right now how can we invite this back in how can we invite more peace and more harmony going forward how can we make different connections around that part of ourselves or other people right mars so getting to mars mars in charge of Aries, right? It's our personal superhero energy. I love this about Mars, right? Mars can be our personal, kind of like our personal hype man, if you will, the one that gives us kind of the courage and the energy to like, you can do it. You can go. We got this. All right, let's, I'm scared, but let's go, right? Mars can be a really, really beautiful planet in our chart. And just like Mercury or any of the other planets, it might be conscious, Right? It might be unconscious. We might ha have a strong connection to our Mars in a helpful or skilled way. Right, Mars might not be welcome in our life. Perhaps we come from messaging or um, a social group or um, culture that really 
tries to shut down Mars, right? Warrior energy, um, assertive energy, going for things, passionate energy, those things are not valued. And so Mars can get shut down, right? When Mars gets shut down, it's, it's, it's a sad thing, right? Mars needs something to do. Mars needs something to fight for, something to defend. When Mars doesn't have a job, right? Mars gets really cranky. And that's when Mars can bring out in other people aggression towards us, anger towards us, right? Sharpness, things like that seem to come from the outside at us because we're not connecting to Mars. So connect to your Mars. <laughs> well, we're looking at Mars and Pisces because it's remember, if you remember back to the, the other chart um, that I showed towards the beginning, we're talking about Mars sitting in Pisces. So when a planet is in a sign, as I explained at the beginning, it takes on right? The values, the lens, the perspective of that sign. If we're keeping in theme with the superhero analogy, we're talking about what, what superhero uniform does Mars wear, right? What cape has Mars got on, so to speak? Well, it's going to have Pisces. What's Pisces like? Pisces energy is compassionate, right? It's spiritual, it's diffusive, it's dreamy, it's intuitive, it's mystical, it's otherworldly, it's selfless, right? Boundaryless. When Mars is here, what are some of the benefits, right? Having that spiritual warrior ship, right? And spiritual has gotten to be a bit of a hackneyed term, but I hope you understand what I mean when I'm talking about spiritual, right? Talking about being in touch with yourself and the things that connect us to the bigger right? Parts of ourselves, the things that are beyond the energy, the spirit energy that animates us, whatever that is for you. And it has a great ability to be able to discern when to fight and when to yield, right? Because sometimes yielding is, is forgotten, but it's really important as well. It can be a romantic lover, right? Um, Mars can be very romantic in Pisces, really gets into that compassionate, right? Um, artistic, that muse kind of energy, that poetry kind of energy. But Mars here can also turn into victimhood, right? Turning that stuff on themselves. You know, how could you do this to me? You can't yell at me, right? Oh, you're being terrible to me and then wallow in it. And that can be a problem, right? There could also be a martyrdom compulsion, I'll just step up and sacrifice myself. Like, oh, I always do, right? Being a little dramatic, but Mars and Pisces can actually be dramatic. So we have to be careful with that as well. Again, it might not be us doing that, but just be aware that that could be happening out in the collective or with people that you know. So, right, with astrology, the more you know, the more you have tools in your toolbox to be able to respond to things that come up in your life. When we're talking about Mars being next to Saturn, remember Mars is conjunct Saturn during this eclipse, meaning they're like peanut butter and jelly, they're besties. We're invited towards greatness and mastery, right? Saturn represents the great works of our lives, the things that we strive for and that we seek to become our own personal greatest at over time. But Saturn only gets to that point, we only get to reap the rewards of Saturn if we're willing to work with Saturn, if we're willing to engage with our fear, because Saturn can represent fear, um, our own blocks, our own limitations, right? Saturn sitting in Pisces, these could be things on the subconscious level. Again, things that we see projected out into the world around us that may actually be reflecting what's going on within us. So that's something to take into consideration. And we have to be willing to do it for the long haul because Saturn takes time. Saturn is payoff after. Okay, it's not instant payoff. It's after. It's later. It takes a while. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and there's also a comet that's going next to this eclipse. So we've got all this heavy energy. We've got all this big breakthrough energy, breakdown energy, dissolving energy. And there's a comet. So... Comets are not my area of expertise. I don't really have a lot 
um, of insight on them to share with you, but I just felt I would be remiss if I didn't mention it. Um, the Comet 12P, Pons Brooks, named after the people who are credited with discovering it, is going to be passing by Earth during the eclipse, and it may be visible during the eclipse. So historically, right, traditionally, comets were seen as messengers and harbingers of change. Now, often there's negative associations with them. Um, I don't know how I feel about that. I did some different research on it, but I feel like historically things tend to get negatively skewed anyway. I feel like there's been this tendency to record all the bad things that have happened, right? To do some kind of news reporting on the worst things that go on all the time. Um, so that's historical. So I don't know how much um, weight I personally am going to give to that. I am interested in it. I think it's, again, worth noting that it's highlighting that there's some big message, there's some big change, there's something dramatic going on because comets tend to have about a 71, 72 year orbit. So last time this one came around was June of 1954. So they don't come around all the time, but they do definitely come around um, into our visible spectrum anyway. And I think there's something significant here. What it is, I don't know. We'll find out. Just briefly, the eclipse path. So those of you that are into astrocartography, locational astrology, things like that, when the planets are passing over different parts of our Earth, they activate different energies. And so this particular eclipse is going through Mexico, yes, through the Midwest and northeastern parts of the United States and Newfoundland. The rest of it is pretty much in the ocean. But this eclipse um, for the United States is significant. It's hitting the United States chart pretty, um, what's the word I want to use? It's it's really impacting the United States chart in a heavy hitting way so was the eclipse in 2017 uh, which i think we probably remember hopefully remember if we can remember back that long um these are significant so the united states has been undergoing tremendous amounts of change chaos reordering um the eclipses are just one more part of that story by the way the duration of, of this eclipse is going to be over four minutes so it's going to be significantly longer than the last total solar eclipse that passed over the united states in 2017 that one was a little over two minutes so that's a long a long duration of totality so we'll see if this uh, has long lasting effects or not speaking of effects how will this eclipse affect you so this is always the million dollar question, right? Or billion dollar question, because million isn't that much money anymore, is it? Depending on how you look at it. Um, <clears throat> so the eclipse energy, it can present itself just like any other transit or anything in your natal chart in different ways. Okay, you can experience this in a physical way, right? A tangible way. Perhaps it's more psychologically based for you. It could be, again, social or cultural that maybe it's not affecting you personally in a very visceral way, but it's really loud in the people around you, right? Or out in the collective, like the United States, for example. This is loud in the United States. Um, or this could be a transpersonal energy, things that are just way beyond the self, okay? Or it could be any kind of combination of those energies. So keep that in mind, right? The potential for a personal impact. So when we're talking about will this affect you personally, what you want to look for is you want to look for planets, the nodes, right? The North Node, South Node, which you might have in Aries or Libra, in which case you'd be getting a nodal return, which is significant, um, or angles. So the angles of your chart, right? The ascendant, the descendant, your midheaven, your IC right? Those are the four angles. It's the compass, your personal compass by which you navigate the world. So what you're looking for is anything that's within four degrees. You could go out to five. I usually use four, but you do what works for you, of course, always. So that means because the eclipse is at 19 degrees, right? We're looking at between 15 to 23 degrees of the cardinal signs. 
Okay. Because we're really going to look at things that are conjunction, right? Amplified energy that are square, dynamic, butting up against energy or opposition, meaning they'll come out either in our relationships or there's some kind of thing that we need to confront. So those signs are Aries, Cancer, Libra, and Capricorn. For those of you who are still learning astrology, those are the cardinal signs. Those are the signs which we shift directions. Okay. Those are the planets or points that are really going to feel this eclipse potentially in a more personal way. If you don't have anything at those signs, again, this may not really be something huge in your life. It could be something that's happening out there, so to speak. And then you would also want to look at the house that Aries occupies. Okay, wherever house Aries occupies for you, whether or not you have planets there, that's where this energy potential may show up in your life. Okay, eclipses, aspecting your natal planets. Mm -hmm. So again, we're focusing on the conjunction, the square, and the opposition of planets in your natal chart. That's your birth chart that are between 15 to 23 degrees of the cardinal signs. So if you have any of those occurring with, let's say, your sun, for example, right, it's going to put the focus on your life force energy, right, your authority, your authenticity. Something here is going to be undergoing a kind of change or a, a wake-up call is maybe a better way to say it. It's going to highlight this energy and say, here we go. It's like turning a light on, like a spotlight on something, okay? We're talking about the moon. We're talking about our inner landscape, right? What we need to feel safe and secure and nourished. Perhaps things from our past, right? Things that may have to do with our family or our roots or our culture. It may be our literal home in some way. Mercury, we're talking about themes of the story of our life, right? How we think, how we communicate, how we learn. Um, what are our mental processes like? And we're talking about Venus. We're talking about our values. How do we feel about deserving? What are we talking about in terms of relationships? Venus is one of the relationship planets. What are our patterns in relationship? What are themes potentially around money and possession and financial stories? I didn't put this down, but Venus also has to do with what we find beautiful or attractive, right? That's why she has to do with art and fashion and um, styling. She's a very stylistic planet as well. Mars. So Mars, we're talking about a reboot, right? And a wake-up call around your passions and desires and what drives you. We're talking about, again, when to fight and when to yield. Sometimes if we're conflict averse, it could be really scary and something I'm bringing this up because of that, uh, that Libra energy as well, right? We may need to engage in some way and learn how to do that. And an eclipse can bring things up to get our attention to realize we need to perhaps stand up for ourselves or someone else, right? So Mars also, of course, has to do with things around anger and assertion and our defense mechanisms, right? Our fight our flight, our freeze, our fawn, all that kind of stuff. And this could come up in our relationships as Mars is the other relationship planet, Jupiter. So when we're talking about Jupiter, we're talking about what's being exaggerated. And this could be positive or negative. Remember, keep that in mind with Jupiter, right? What's being exaggerated, what's being expanded, and what's being elevated in your life. Where do you need more optimism and faith, right? What are the themes that are going on around expansion or learning or traveling or exploration, um, things that are beyond your comfort zone might be energized in some way. Saturn. So what are you afraid of? Right? Are you engaging with your fears? There's themes with Saturn around responsibility, right? Duty, accountability. Um, it could be boundaries as well. And the question of, are you willing to work in the long game, right? Are you structuring your life? Are you working on improvements? Are you in some way being responsible for yourself or others? Uranus, an eclipses aspect, Uranus. We're talking a lot about fitting in an exclusion, similar to Chiron in that way. Yeah. So if you have um, something aspecting Uranus, in a sense, this is almost like a double energy, especially with Pluto being an Aquarius as well, the sign that Uranus rules. 
we're talking a lot about um, being in the group, not being in the group, right? Topics around that in some way. We're also talking about the need for changes, to be outside the box, to reinvent ourselves, to engage with liberation or even revolution, right? When we're talking about revolution, the turning of the wheel, that can bring with it unexpected, um, surprising events, right? Revelations, or again, a turning of fortune. And that could be a positive thing. So don't get stuck on Uranus is always negative. It's not. It can be a really awesome, positive planet if you learn how to make friends with it. Neptune, we're talking about topics around disillusionment, right? Not seeing clearly and blind spots we might have. We're talking about increased sensitivity, right? Compassion and intuition, getting in touch with our dreams, with things that are beyond tangible, right? Beyond proving. Um, we want to, in some way, engage with Neptune in a healthy right, invited way so that we can get back in touch with our spiritual nature, with our giving nature, with our compassion for ourselves and our others, right, so that we can avoid escaping things, get in touch with things. With Pluto, Pluto is a fun one with the eclipses. Um, when Pluto is meeting up with the eclipse and the nodes, right, we're talking about triggering subconscious memories and potentially wounds why it's not doing that to punish you right again pluto can really be your friend if you understand why pluto is triggering the heck out of you right it's trying to bring your attention to something that needs resolution within you so that you can transcend it so that you can alchemize it so that it no longer has to be a thorn in your side right once you get that about pluto that's where the buried treasure is because pluto also rules hidden riches Okay, they're hidden for a reason. You got to dig for them. You got to do the work. And a lot of people that don't like Pluto don't want to do the work. They don't want to go into the scary, dirty, dark, shameful places of themselves. It's They'd rather ignore it, right, and project it. So if you're willing to engage with Pluto, the eclipses can really bring things to the forefront and, again, energize them in a way where you can make in a sense, like a like an evolutionary leap forward, potentially. But it will bring things up from the past, most likely, before you can get there. You could also be talking about themes of detoxification, right? That could be in a literal sense or psychological sense, etc. We're talking about renewal and rebirth. And we're talking around topics around power and control. What does it mean to have power and control? What is right use of power and control? What does it mean to be empowered and disempowered? What does it mean to join with those who you think are more powerful than you? What does that say about you? What does it say about them? What does that say about your relationship to power? Right? All of these things could come up. And again, we're not judging them. We're just looking at them because we all engage with these things. We all have a Pluto somewhere. And we all have Pluto transiting somewhere. Okay. The nodal axis itself. So... When the nodes conjunct square or oppose themselves in your chart, we're talking about big check-ins, right? These happen about every four and a half years, but it's like, it's like getting someone doing a checkup on you and being like, how are you doing? How's that project going? Are you okay? Do you need groceries? Have you slept? <laughs> so this can be a really, really great point where we look at something and we go, how are we doing? How far off our path have we gone? Oh, wow. The nodes will whoop they'll snap you back into place, potentially, if, if you're willing to work with them, right? If you're on track, it's going to feel great. It's going to bring you stuff where you're like, yes, I'm getting confirmation that I'm doing the stuff and I'm going to keep going, okay? We're talking about our ascendant and descendant. We're talking about self and other, right? But we're also talking about things that will potentially, and this is the same with the midheaven and um, the immancelli, potentially, we're talking about things that affect the compass of the chart how we navigate our lives. So this could be energizing changes and reorientation to how we see the world, right? How we interact with the other people we meet in the world. Again, themes around the self and relationships. This is very similar to that Aries Libra type of energy. And this could be also things about our impressions or our appearance. It could be something as literal as, you know, always having long hair and then cutting it off or something like that. 
So it could be something simple. It doesn't always have to be big and dramatic, even though that could be big and dramatic for you. I don't want to, to limit that. When we're talking about the midheaven, right? The MC and the IC. We're talking about themes around where you've come from and where you're going, right? What's at your roots? What's at the top of your tree? The midheaven has to do with your reputation, right? Your achievements and your profession, who you profess yourself to be out in the world, what you're known for. Uh, this could be about re-examining where you came from, right? And where you want to go. How are you on that path? What's going on there? This could be changes to topics from the past, um, family of origin kinds of things. There could be changes to what and where we call home in some way. Okay. So now that we've gone through all that kind of energy and we're looking back at this eclipse chart, what do you see now? Right, I put the eclipse chart at zero Aries because I know a lot of you are in different time zones. So adjust for your own time zone or just, you know, rotate the wheel so that it matches your Aries Libra houses. But what do you see now? What does this eclipse bring for you now? Right. There's so much here around, again, dissolving big changes. Right. Um, sense of self, identity, purpose, where we're going, our value, our worth, our resources. Like, how are we interacting with these things? One of the big things that stands out to me on this chart as well is the lack of aspects. Right. It's predominantly, as I mentioned in the beginning, all conjunctions. We got a pair. We've got a pair, right? Runner, donor. All of these things are together. We have, of course, one opposition with that south node. And then we have Pluto making a sextile over to Venus. Okay, so that'll be Pluto Venus. Other than that, there's not a lot going on. So when we look at a chart that's full of conjunction energy, it's full of amplified energy. It's full of this huge sense of almost like a power surge, right? This is going to be a lot of, a lot of breakdowns, right? Pisces, Pluto and Aquarius and breakthroughs. All of this Aries energy. And then again, this Taurus with the Jupiter and Uranus. We have this in conjunction here, this quincunx between the South Node and Saturn. So there is something here, and we're talking about quincunx energy. We're talking about the need for resolution, the need to include things. So there's something from the past that needs to be included with this Saturn. What do we have that we need to take a look at that has to do with the Libra part of our chart that needs to be incorporated with Saturn, that maybe needs uh, responsibility or accountability that maybe needs to be restructured in some way or needs boundaries or something along those lines. So don't discount Saturn in this char chart either, even though I didn't spend a lot of time on Saturn. Saturn in Pisces is really an interesting planet. It is definitely dissolving um, a lot of traditions. A lot of things are breaking apart, right? I think we can see that. I think we, we are aware of that. Saturn is also in Pisces, bringing back a lot of ancient traditions as well, which I think is incredible because we need them now. We had so much separation for such a long time between spirituality and science, right? We're having, um, which is a totally different topic, but we're having, a, in a sense, a modern day inquisition. Not that the inquisition has ever completely stopped. Thank you very much, Vatican. Um, but it's coming back up. Right. We need to now science, in a sense, is the modern religion. And if you don't, you know, comply with that, then, you know, right. Cancel culture. Same kind of thing. We need to bring back some of these ancient traditions so that we can begin a new cycle, Aries. Right. Of being with ourselves and in the world that's more integrated. In a sense, Aries also represents like our, our instinctive self, our, I don't offend anyone by saying this, but like our animalistic self, right? Being in a body with these desires. It's very Aries. It's very Mars as well. Mars also rules Scorpio, right? We're talking about the lived experience of being here and having um, 
having all of these things go on with us that maybe aren't so civil and pretty and composed, right? Libra, but they're nonetheless a part of our experience. Like being able to, like the beautiful Aries, uh, Maya Angelou said, like grab life by the, like by the lapels, right? And kick some ass. Such a beautiful Aries thing of her to say, right? Where is that? But how can we bridge it? How can we bring it back in with this Pisces energy? Where do we need to bring back the lost traditions of how we are connected to everything beyond us, right? Whether that's through quantum physics or that's through, again, bringing back ancient traditions, um, bringing back the fragmented pieces that have been lost for thousands of years during the procession of the equinox time period of the age of Pisces, removing towards Aquarius. I don't personally think we're there yet. I think we're in the, the transition period. I think we're seeing the crossover point personally. Um, but either way, I think we're seeing all this preview. I think we're getting ready to get ready for all of that. But how can we, over the next two and a quarter years, bring these things together in our life? What do you need to incorporate on a personal level that also brings in this transpersonal level, the things that are beyond, right? What do you have to share? When you're thinking about this, I'm about to go through the houses. But when you're thinking about this, what do you already possess, Taurus? right? Jupiter, one of the rulers of Pisces sitting here, what do you already possess within you that is of value? Also Taurus, right? Venus as well, that you can share with the collective that you have to give. What can you think about when you're thinking about your Aries house, when you're thinking about planting seeds that you can bring forward, that you already have, that you may not even realize is valuable? And how can you bring that out in a bigger expression out in the world? How can you animate it and give it life, right? From the primordialness, the darkness, the oneness of Pisces, we become individual expressions. How can you breathe life into that? How can you give that animation to something in the Aries part of your chart? Okay, how can you do that? How can you bring that forward? Keep all of that in mind as we're going through. And another piece, the last thing I think I want to say here is how can you move beyond, again, I've said it before, I'm going to say it again, that's that projection. How can you heal that? How can you let things, in a sense, dissolve and break down so that something new can emerge? How can you heal that? How can you leave behind any stories of victimization, right? They're really, really big right now. It's very, very popular to, to engage with that, to engage in that kind of trauma dumping and things like that. Not that it's wrong, but how can you move beyond it? How can you take that and alchemize it? Chiron, heal it, right? How can you do that? Keep all that in mind as we go through the houses. All right, in the first house, my beautiful Aries risings, the first house has to do with the self, how we meet the world, what other people's first impressions are of us. It has to do with our physical body, right? The way we are animated and incarnated, our first breath of life, right? How is this undergoing a change, right? What process of creating a new self that has come from the revelations around your personal relationships, right? How you earn a living, um, where you live, all of those kinds of things. How is this coming through? What seeds do you want to plant in this area of your life? Another possibility here is um, what ways of seeing and being in the world are undergoing a change or healing? What kinds of connections can you make in order to bring more fullness into this area of your life? Potentially other parts of your self-identity or the ways in which you are in relationship, having relationship patterns, right, that need to be left behind so that the new things can emerge, right? Remember, because in this house, you would have Pisces in your 12th house, right? So some of this is subconscious, right? What, what in the subconscious needs to dissolve away, in a sense? And 
one of the questions here that also comes with that is where are you willing to let go of any places where you have felt like yourself, right? Maybe engaging in things like martyrdom, for example, right? Offering yourself up as a sacrificial platter. What ways in which potentially has this come up over the last few years that you're like, you know, I see that now and I'm not going to engage with it anymore. What do you want to plant in this house for yourself? That's a new way of taking up space and saying, I am here and I'm ready to go. Second house, Pisces rising. So the second house has to do with how we support ourselves through our talents, our capacities and our resources, right? It's what we possess. And that might be tangible, that might be intangible. So in some ways, it describes our earning potential, right? But it also describes what we find valuable and what we enjoy. This is Taurus's house. Taurus is about enjoying life through the five senses, right? So with Aries here, we're talking about has your sense of self-value perhaps been extra sensitive or felt vulnerable over these last few years? right? Is it maybe undergoing a spiritual kind of evolution? Does your sense of identity, does it match with what you possess, right? Or your resources is another way to look at this. Or could it potentially be wrapped up in what you or your partner possess or don't, right? And the questions here, are you interested in making new connections or learning new skills that could support you? Are you interested in planting seeds of new ways of looking at value and resources and your earning potential. Third house, Aquarius rising. So when we're talking about the third house, we're talking about our local environment. We're talking about short journeys. So in the modern age, it's kind of losing its its uh, significance. But I think about it in terms of like, if I got on my bike and rode to it, could I arrive there? That's to me is a short journey. We're talking about making connections. We're talking about uh, learning and communicating and writing and speaking, We're talking about languages as well. We're talking to relationships to our siblings. And um, I probably should have included this, but it's also kind of our first steps outside of the home, right? Where we go to school or perhaps it is uh, clubs or organizations that we join. I know that's also 11th house, but they are related. They're in trying there. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. But it also has to do with when we're talking about the, the solar eclipse here, can you make more enthusiastic or inspired connections to your community, right? What can you share here? What seeds do you want to plant to make yourself in a sense like known? Would you be open to new learning, to learning new skills, perhaps, or trades or subjects, or maybe it is a literal language, right? Is there something that you can be open to learning here? In some way, you can change your perception, perhaps. And another question here is, how is your messaging from your early years, right, been undergoing a healing? Now, all of us went through an early life experience. We all had some kind of youthful experience that perhaps was painful or caused us rejection. So this could be something that's coming up. Maybe it's happening with your, your brothers and sisters in some way. Maybe there's a healing that could take place or connections you can make to move past this. Um, it could also be, you know, in connection to your neighbors or your neighborhood. And something here wants to be planted to make a new beginning where you say, I can be here. I can take up space. I'm willing to let go of other things so that I feel more connected, right, to myself and the community around me. Fourth house. So this is one of the angular houses. This is one of the houses that has to deal potentially with our, um, our roots, right, our IC. This house describes the bottom of the chart. It's our inner security, right? Our sense of privacy, our sense of sanctuary. It could be our literal home or that which feels like home. It has to do with our family and our roots and our generational inheritance. It's also the end or the bottom of the matter. So this could describe for some of you uh, retirement or the retirement phase of life. So when we're talking about the fourth house, what changes in your home or family environment have been coming up to better support your public self or your ambitions? What in your past 
are you ready to put behind you so that you can fully step into your future? Are you ready to find connection to your emotional needs in a new way? Or perhaps reparent yourself? For those of you where that's applicable, how can you do that? What recent changes potentially to your relationships, right? That's your relationship to yourself. That's your relationship to your others, right? Perhaps the partnerships you're in. How has that been changing, right? How has your work or your residence or that which you call home led to a new beginning where you feel at home within yourself? How can that, how can seeds be planted there? What seeds do you want to plant there to see grow out into the world as this eclipse energy moves forward and ripens over the next two and a quarter years? The fifth house, my beautiful Sag risings. The fifth house is where we want to be seen, right? It's our creative actualization. It's our inner heart and our inner child. This could describe literal children for those of you where that's appropriate. This has to do with, um, I call it the house of fun, right? It's, it's our hobbies, it's our games, it's our leisure and our pleasure, it's our romantic pursuits, it's love affairs, it's risk-taking and gambling, all of those fun things, depending on what your idea of fun is. And again, that's also what this fifth house has to do with, is do you feel anchored in things that you enjoy? Right? And how does this potentially change your vision of the future? Are you willing to let go of painful emotional stories from your past or from your family messaging about your self-identity or how you project yourself into the world? Remember, just because we associate Aries with being bold and daring and headfirst and courageous doesn't automatically make it so. There could be, especially with Chiron going through here, something that brings to light a place where maybe that hasn't been true for you. So does your self-actualization or creativity feel like it's ready for a reboot? Or it's like, here I am. This is what I want to do. This is what I enjoy. I'm going to pursue that because it's also going to lend itself over to the other side of this axis, which has to do with your 11th house, which is the groups and organizations that you belong to and the, the ways in which you see yourself going forward or see your life developing in some kind of way. How can you do that now, right? And for some of you, this has to do with romance, right? This could be about healing past hurts or past stories around romance, or romantic pursuits or love affairs in some way. So for some of you, this could indicate, right, meeting someone new or having a phase in your life where you're ready to be in healthy partnership or at least, you know, have some fun on the way there um, after this eclipse. So the sixth house, my beautiful Scorpio risings, the sixth house has to do with our day-to-day routine, right? This is Virgo's house. So this is about the day-to-day details. This is about routines and about rituals. This is one of the houses of health, right? This is where we have a mind-body connection. This also describes our working environment, right? If that's applicable to you or places potentially where you volunteer or go to be of service. This house also describes unequal partnerships, right? Like a boss employee or student teacher, things like that. Um, this could also have a connection to animals, right, to your pets um, or to pet projects. And this also could be around things that are your skills that you repeat over and over and over because you want to achieve mastery. So this is in some sense like apprenticeship towards doing something perfection through repeating it, right? So this has to do with our, our technical details as well. So when we look at this, what parts of your daily routine or work environment no longer serve your sense of harmony, right? What do you want to plant here? Perhaps you've been undergoing some things at work that have brought up painful realizations around yourself. Like, are you valued at work for who you are and your individual contribution? It's a possibility, right? What would you like that to look like instead? How can you, in a sense, enrich your spiritual life to balance that day-to-day -day routine life? Like, what do you need there? Because remember, on the other side of this is that 12th house where Libra would be, 
right? What do we need to incorporate so that that Aries part of you, that's that part that stands up and takes up space and is ready to go forward with the fire of life can actually do that. Is there a creative expression? Because remember the house behind is that fifth house, right? Is there a creative expression with all that Pisces there that you would like to devote more attention to in your day-to-day -day life? Is there something being born out of that that you would like to incorporate more? And then the other things to consider here is, are you healing from patterns of self-criticism? This could be rejection as well, right? Um, or self-neglect or potentially physical pains. Um, with that Chiron here, there's not an impossibility around having some kind of physical um, ailment or pain or something that's come up, whether it's chronic or whether it's acute. And again, none of this isn't medical advice, but it could potentially come up with Aries there, right? Um, maybe it has to do with the head or migraines or something like that. Um, is there been something coming up that needs your attention that you can plant seeds in so that you can get your vitality back on track? Seventh house, Libra rising. So this is Libra's natural house, right? This is where we encounter the other in terms of relationships. And this is relationships of all kinds that are on equal footing, whether they're business, they're romantic, they're intimate, they're contractual, right? Whether they're negotiated in some way, this is one-on-one. -on -one. So this house also has one of the challenges of dealing with open enemies, right? Those with whom we do not get along. Um, our adversaries is another way to say it. This is the house of the not self and our projections. So as I've mentioned a few times throughout this video, one of the greatest benefits that I see potentially on this total eclipse chart is healing from projection, right? Our not self. So these things are the dynamics that get played out in other people we encounter in our lives, right? Things that we are not fully conscious of yet. And Aries is one of those energies that isn't necessarily the most conscious because it's it's the baby of the zodiac it's beginning and this doesn't mean you're a baby in relationships or anything like that i mean it could you know but it doesn't mean that it could be something that is very positive in your life that you haven't yet fully made peace with or integrated in some way so keeping that in mind when you're planting the seeds of this new moon this total solar eclipse what ways of being in relationship no longer serve your sense of independence? And that could go either way, right? With that Libra rising, it could be that you compromise too much, right? Going along to get along. And that Aries part of your chart in that seventh house has been a bit neglected. Perhaps it's the opposite. You know, perhaps it's that I want to be so independent that I don't want to be in relationship of any kind. And I'm just going to be over here doing my own thing, my separateness. And that's that. It's another possibility. Those are extreme examples. But in what way would you like to create seeds of change in that seventh house in regards to your relationships and your sense of independence? Can you resolve situations with adversaries that are draining your vitality? I really feel like this is a big one. When I've sat down, I meditate on these charts for weeks before I talk about them on YouTube or, or with other people. And this is the thing that kept coming up for me um, in this chart in particular is, is there like a grudge or a something, you know, Aries, Aries can lock horns, right? With things that you just can walk away from. Is there, is there something there that maybe it's like, you know, for my new chapter in my life, I got to let this ish go. So that's a possibility there. Um, and again, do you recognize patterns of projection? And with that Mars being in charge of Aries, if we're not in touch with our Mars, it can come out through our relationships in less than optimal ways, right? Perhaps we're finding ourselves in situations or contracts or or again, any kind of relationship with people where other people are being Mars towards us. And it's like, where the heck did that come from, right? So looking at those kinds of places, or maybe you see other people being very Aries, being very Mars, being able to be independent. You're like, wow, I wish I could do that. Well, guess what? You can. <laughs> it's right there. It's right on your chart. 
Um, has your sense of self, work, or home, because this is also one of the angular houses, undergone changes that are being reflected in your relationships? Perhaps um, you've recently decided to move house, right? Maybe you're moving to another state or another location, and that is going to bring new independence, new types of things, new people to interact with, right? It could be something like that. Or perhaps you're changing careers or changing jobs, and now there's new people right, with whom you can interact. So how has that happened? If that's happened, what kinds of seeds do you want to plant going forward to hopefully get some kind of optimal um, new beginning in this house? The eighth house, Virgo rising. So Aries in the eighth, we're talking with the eighth house about transformation. Remember, this is Scorpio's house. So the nice part here is that we have an Aries ruled sign in an Aries ruled house. And if that confuses you, just, you know, skip it, leave it out. But for those of you that understand what I'm saying, you understand what I'm saying. Now, when we're talking about this house, we're talking about transformation, transmutation, regeneration, right? The eighth house is also where we go to rest and recuperate and regenerate in addition to the fourth house and the 12th house. When we're talking about the eighth house, we're talking about things that have to do with psychological um, processes, potentially the esoteric, right? Taboo subjects um, and occult subjects. Um, this house has to do with other people's assets and resources. That's also why it's the house of inheritance as well. Things that we get from other people. Um, it really describes that which is shared. So that which is shared has to do with merging and union. It has to do with intimacy, with secrets, and with our private life. Or someone else's private life. Perhaps um, you work in a field where that is required of you in some way. So when we're talking about this eighth house, potentially we're talking about what, what buried topics have come to light for you to resolve. Remember with Chiron here, um, Chiron is going to bring up things that have been painful, that at least in a sense are sensitized, sensitive. Perhaps you're being made aware of sensitivities in other people that you're interacting with or have some kind of intimate um, or joint partnership with. Perhaps this could be something around relationship wounds, for example. Um how can you better trust your instincts, right, when it comes to commitment or collaboration? Could this also be, you know, sometimes when we get stuck in patterns of fight and flight or fawn and freeze, sometimes our instincts aren't as reliable as we think they are because we're reacting, again, in that kind of animalistic, reactive, you know, act first, think later way, sometimes that can get us stuck in patterns of being reactive when that's not necessarily um, the best response to the situation. So that's something that's coming up for me as I'm, as I'm imagining this and, and, and intuiting this as well. Um, there's a possibility here with the eighth house that this energy may show up with your partner. Okay, so this could be something, and again, this could be intimate, this could be a business partner, it could be a client, um, something like that. Um, something here where their resources have changed in some way that requires more self-sufficiency from you or vice versa. That's a possibility here. With the eighth and the second house, there is always a possibility of finances being on the table here. And then lastly, is there some kind of sensitivity around joint financial ventures? With Chiron here, there could have been something that came up around um, a partnership agreement that maybe caught you off guard or, or became sensitive in some way. So again, possibilities there. When we're talking about the ninth house, we're talking about my beautiful Leo risings. So the ninth house has to do with beliefs and faith, higher education, philosophies and theosophies, um, broader view, right? Sag this is Sagittarius' house. So this is like really expanding out and saying what else is out there. Okay. So this could be things around people or cultures or ideas that are foreign, meaning again, they're further away from what is um, common for you. 
Um, we're talking about long distance travel. So things you would get to by long distance train or boats or, or airplanes, something like that. We're talking about the search for meaning. And the search for meaning can show up in many, many different ways. Um, it can throw, show up through symbols. For example, this has to do with, this is Jupiter's house. So being elevated, right? This could be about publishing, about ethics, about laws, about spiritual truths, uh, about teaching, about mentoring, about guides. There's a lot going on in this ninth house. It's a pretty important house, actually. Um, so there's a possibility here that you've been undergoing, and I wrote ego death. It's not my my favorite term, but I couldn't think of a better one. Um, undergoing an ego death or a sense of self-perception, right? In terms of what you thought you knew or believed to be true, right? So coming out of that eighth house, right? There could be a lot of things that came up in that eighth house with Chiron and ninth house. There could be some kind of wounding to something you thought you knew or believed in or were brought up with, right? That now no longer resonates. So the question here is now what holds meaning for you? What do you want to plant seeds in? What do you want to grow in terms of um, what your belief systems are? Can you let go of painful relationship dynamics, right? And open yourself up to new possibilities. Again, we're talking about stuff that happened in that eighth house, potentially with Pisces on that eighth house, having Neptune there and Mars and Saturn. Is there something here that got brought up that now in this ninth house, you're like, you know what? Wow, I really want to open out to something bigger than, you know, this small space that I had been in because I went through so much change through this eighth house, through this um, south node being in the third house, right? What was in my local environment no longer resonates for me. How can I open up myself bigger, right? How can I relate to things that are bigger than just what I thought I knew? And then along these lines, are you potentially ready for new guides or mentoring? to come into your awareness. Now that could be you, that could be someone else, right? You could be the mentor. It might be that you need to step into that role or want to step in that role because you have so many things that you want to share here, right? All the things that you've learned, you're ready to be enthusiastic and amp other people up. Or it could be the other way around, right? That a teacher shows up in your life and opens up these worlds of possibility to a new chapter, a new belief, a new... um um, place of meaning for you. And of course, adventures and travel, that's a possibility here too. You know, how can you have more of those things or plant the seeds to again, engage, whether you physically travel there or not, um, with new experiences, the 10th house. 10th house, my beautiful cancer risings. This is another one of those angular houses. So it has the potential to interact with the other angular houses being the opposite fourth house and the first and seventh house as well. Just depends on where your midheaven and um, icy lie. But either way, the tenth house, it's an elevated house. It's up at the top of the chart along with the ninth. And it has to do with our place in society. Okay. It's social recognition. It's achievements. It's our professions and who we profess ourselves to be. It is what we aspire to, what we look up to, right? Our inner authority. It describes long-term goals and also our legacies. What do we want to be known for, right? Or what are we known for? So when we're talking about the eclipse happening here, we're talking about with Chiron, because remember, we have to keep in mind Chiron here as well. Chiron is exact with this. How can you bridge the gap between where you are and where you want to be in your professional or public identity? Chiron is going to show you, has been showing you as it's been moving through this 10th house, that there's been something off here. There has been something that's needed change. There has been something sensitive that's come up over these past six years. So how can with Mars, right, being the ruling planet here, needing some action, how can you bridge that gap? What is it that you need? Can you be open to it? 
Is there some humility perhaps that you need in relationship to your public identity so that it can be healed or transformed or so that you can become a mentor to others, perhaps it's the other people around you that are going through these things and you have wisdom to share, right? So along those lines, are you healing from rejection or disappointment in your professional identity? And this also could go along with early messaging because we're talking about the um, the ascendant potentially or the first house potentially here. Also this fourth house, right, where we came from, this has to do in some way with our roots, potentially our parenting, um, potentially those those um, generational things that have been passed down to us or that we've seen or inherited in some way. What here has been coming up that you're ready to let go of so that you can heal any pain, rejection, disappointment around how life was supposed to be. And along that, what requires resolution between what you have been conditioned by, again, this is the past, right, and other people, and the new beliefs and philosophies that you have been learning and mastering, because we're talking about, remember, that ninth house would be the Pisces house, right? What connections have you made or are making are going to help you when you're planting seeds of going forward, wanting to take up space and saying, you know what, this is who I am now. This is where I'm going now. This is what I have to share out in the world now. Because ultimately, the question here is, are you ready to go in a new direction with how your life is oriented? So big questions on that 10th house. 11th house, Gemini rising. So when we're talking about 11th house, we're talking about our alliances, our groups and our teams, right? Our associations. This is the house of friendships. It's our also the house of our hopes and our dreams, right? For the future. It's where we see things going because this is Aquarius's house, right? This is Aquarius is a visionary energy. So this also has to do with causes and humanitarian efforts uh, and the desire to be a part of something bigger and to contribute to the group, right? To be interconnected with other people in some way. So with Chiron here, there's a possibility that there have been sensitive issues or again, sensitivity towards who and what you have been associated with. Okay, so this could be in a literal sense, the groups you've been identified with. This could be dynamics that are happening within a group, okay, that you're aware of. Um, the question becomes, are you ready to explore new groups and associations that better reflect your individual expression? With Pisces on that 10th house, you've had a lot going on in that 10th house of public self, right? With Libra on that fifth house, right, the, the opposite house here, having to do with here I am, this is what I'm about, this is what I want to do. Again, with that 10th house, how we do it out in the world, 11th house, who we share it with, who's the audience. There's such a fine line with our audiences of, you know, acceptance and rejection or being seen as a genius versus, you know, a crazy person or a heretic or like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you would ever do that, right? <laughs> it's one of, those, one of those fun parts of, of group dynamics, right? So there's a possibility here that there's a need for, for new people, right? New things, new ways that you can be yourself, because there might be a need to express yourself uniquely instead of identifying with what the group has defined you to be. When we have this Aries, right, this I-oriented energy in a house of a collective, there's an interesting balance that happens here. So the trick is to find the right groups that you identify with and identify with you in ways that are positive, Right, in ways that are enriching and life affirming that give you life and vitality and vice versa, you bring life and vitality to them versus not, right? Because the question is with the 11th house also is what contributions do you want to make? What do you want to share? What do you know that's of value? Where are you being a visionary in a new way that you want to plant seeds for so that it'll go forward, right? 
to help the collective. And finally, 12th house, Taurus rising, Aries in that 12th house. The 12th house is a complicated house. It's traditionally called the house of self undoing. And if you've heard me talk about this before, you know that I talk about it in two ways. One, where we go to undo the ties that bind or where we are undone by our subconscious blocks. Maybe both, right? The 12th house, as I mentioned in the beginning, it's the return to oneness. It's the end of the zodiac. It's where we begin again in Aries, right? We've gone all the way around our individual expressions, our relationship expressions, our group expressions back into the one so that we can be reborn again, right? And we all have rebirths over and over again in our lives in some way. So when we're talking about this 12th house, we're also talking about things that are mystical or ethereal, right? Things that go beyond just the sixth house, the mundane, right? It's the extraordinary, extraordinary, ordinary, extraordinary, right? So it's the house of our dreams. It's the house of our unconscious cords of memory where we are tapped into not just the collective, but beyond the collective. It's that fabric of whatever that vital force is that animates us, right? That, that's that ocean of possibility in which we become an individual expression. You literally have that juxtaposition in this house with that Aries placement there. This could also be about where we can be of greater service to the whole. Um, the 12th and the 6th house have to do with being of service and giving things away, sharing things. The challenge with both of these houses and with this axis is, again, victim identity and martyrdom. It doesn't even have to be um, victim identity. It could be victimization, right? Um, doing too much for other people that they need to do for themselves perhaps, or feeling compelled to step up to the plate to um, offer your services or to take responsibility for something. And then oh, it creates you know, a situation where you feel taken advantage of at the end, or maybe literally are taken advantage of at the end. So part of this has to do with those who work against us, right? Seventh house is open opponents, people that we know about, 12th house is the ones we don't know about. Stuff that's behind the scenes. And again, this could be us. This could be our subconscious that's tripping us up. That's creating problems, right? In a not so nefarious way, this is literally just things that are behind the receipts. Things that going on in a literal sense, maybe behind the curtain. We talked about this before. Maybe you work in a theater, right? And you literally work behind the curtain. There could be a literal expression here. Um, in a psychological sense, it could be where you go to retreat, right? Where you need to take time away, starting new beginnings here, right? Being able to bring to light hidden aspects of yourself. So we've gone through this Pisces in the 11th house, right? These changes that are still happening in terms of where you feel you belong in the collective, your friend groups, who you associate with, what you associate with. When we're talking about that and we're moving towards this 12th house, what have you been resolving in terms of your subconscious patterns? How have you been resolving, again, the chaos potentially within and the chaos without? Have you been doing too much for other people and not enough for yourself? That's a possibility here with Aries in that 12th house. How can you move beyond disillusionment? Right, with the collective to find a new form of connection. It's possible with Neptune and Saturn and Mars right now in that 11th house that there's some fatigue around people. Right, There may be some fatigue around the collective because both the 11th and the, and the 12th house have to do with our connection to everyone else. Right, It's possible there's some fatigue here. Or some disillusionment. Like, wow, I really thought this stuff was a different way. And now I see that it's not. These things that I thought were solid are dissolving. And with Taurus on that first house, you know, that may not be very comfortable. Depending on where you have your planets. But 
there's something here that's asking you to look differently and say, how can I share my passions in a new way? How can I find a new breath of life? How can I connect with that which is beyond me and bring it down into myself so that I feel more in harmony and more in balance? What seeds can you plant here that you want to develop and grow over the next two and a quarter years? Whew. Okay, we made it through that whole video. There was a lot to talk about um, on this eclipse. It's a huge eclipse. It's a big marker of a new chapter for all of us. There's a lot going on. Um, again, you might feel this in a personal way. You might not. Maybe something that's happening out in the collective that you see. I hope that gave you a much better sense of the totality of this eclipse because it's not just about that Aries sun and moon and that new moon sense. It's not just about that north node being there. It's so much more. And when we look at it in totality, it hopefully give you a much deeper connection and understanding with yourself, your chart, perhaps people that are around you, perhaps it's society, right, that you've been looking at in some way. So I will also link below uh, the video on the lunar eclipse in Libra, as well as the Aries equinox, because I talk about some of these other things in more detail, if you are interested there. Either way, I hope this was helpful. Let me know in the comments. And as always, take care. Mwah. Bye for now.